Welcome to part two of the Intro to Exam P YouTube series. In this video, we're going to cover an introduction to discrete random variables. It's going to be super quick and beginner friendly, so let's get into it. Because univariate random variables are such a large part of the syllabus, we're going to break this section down into several videos. In this video, we'll cover the core principles around discrete random variables. In the next video, we'll cover the seven types of discrete random variables tested on the exam. We'll then extend the concepts in this video to continuous random variables and finish off this section with insurance math. In the first part of the series, we talked about probabilities. As a simple example, the probability of tossing a coin and having it land on heads or tails is 50% for heads and 50% for tails. But what if we wanted to calculate something a little more complicated, like the probability that in 20 coin flips, there are five heads, or instead of a fair coin, the coin has a 60% chance of landing on heads. This is why we introduce random variables because they give us a systematic way to write out the outcomes of a random experiment. Exam P covers two types of random variables, discrete and continuous. A discrete random variable is one that can take on a countable number of distinct values. So an example would be the number of heads in a series of coin flips. A continuous random variable, on the other hand, is one that takes on an uncountable number of values. So for example, the height of a person or the weight of an object. With discrete random variables, each outcome has a non-zero probability. The set of all values with non-zero probability is known as the support of the random variable. Continuous random variables work a little bit differently, but we'll talk about that later in the series. So if you don't want to miss out, be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for details. The fundamental building block of a discrete random variable is its probability mass function. The probability mass function gives the probability of each outcome of the random variable. For example, if we let x represent the number of heads in three coin flips, the possible values of x are 0, 1, 2, and 3, and the respective probabilities are 1 8, 3 8, 3 8, and 1 8. This distribution is specifically known as a binomial distribution, which we'll cover later in this series, but for now let's assume that these numbers are correct. It's customary to use capital letters for random variables. So in this example, capital X represents the number of heads obtained when flipping a coin three times. Lowercase x represents the value of each possible outcome. So lowercase x can take on the values 0, 1, 2, or 3. To qualify as a PMF, two conditions have to be met. The first condition is that the probability of each outcome must range from 0 to 1. The second condition is that the sum of all probabilities totals 1. In this example, both conditions are met, so this is a valid PMF. From the probability mass function, we can then derive the cumulative distribution function. The CDF describes the probability that capital X will take on a value less than or equal to lowercase x. Going back to the coin flip example, the probability that x is less than or equal to 0 is 1 8th. The probability that x is less than or equal to 1 is 1 8th plus 3 8ths. The probability that x is less than or equal to 2 is 1 8th plus 3 8ths plus 3 8ths. And the probability that x is less than or equal to 3 is 1 8th plus 3 8ths plus 3 8ths plus 1 8th. By definition, CDFs are always going to be non-decreasing, and the probability for the largest value is always going to be 1. Informally, the expected value of a random variable is simply its mean or average. We can calculate the expected value by taking a weighted average of the probabilities and the outcomes associated with those probabilities. So in the coin toss example, when we take the average of the number of heads appearing in three coin tosses and weigh it by the associated probabilities from the PMF, we get that the expected value of the random variable is 1.5. So that means on average, we can expect 1.5 heads to appear in three coin tosses. We can also take the expectation of a function of a random variable and calculate its value. The methodology is very similar to calculating the expected value of a random variable, but instead of multiplying x by the probabilities, we multiply g of x by the probabilities. If we let the function be x squared, then the first step in calculating e of x squared is to list out the x squared values for each x. From there, we take each x squared, multiply by its associated probability, and sum up the results. This gets us a value of e of x squared equals 3. This function is also known as the second raw moment of x, and to generalize, the nth raw moment of x is denoted by e of x to the n. The reason we explain the second raw moment is because we can use it to calculate the second central moment, also known as the variance. The variance is defined as the expected value of the square deviation of x from its mean. So if the outcomes of your experiment are concentrated around the mean, then you're typically going to have a lower variance. 
and the more spread out the outcomes are from the mean, the higher the variance. When solving questions on the exam, in most cases, it's more efficient to use the shortcut formula for the variance. This formula states that the variance of x is equal to the second raw moment minus the expected value squared. In the example from earlier, we can now calculate the variance of x to be 0.75. The standard deviation of x is the square root of the variance of x. The reason we use the standard deviation instead of the variance sometimes is because the unit is in line with the unit for the mean. Alright, the last formula in this introductory video is the coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation is simply the standard deviation divided by the mean. While the standard deviation is an absolute measure of dispersion from the mean, the coefficient of variation is a relative measure of dispersion because the coefficient already factors in the mean. That just about wraps it up for this quick introduction. In the next video, we're going to cover the seven types of discrete random variables tested on the exam. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.